I just want to say I'm married to the big, greatest Bono fan on the planet, so you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, he does pay tax. Um, okay. Once upon a time, when the pigs drank wine, and monkeys chewed tobacco, and little birds built their nests in old men's beards, and gods walked the earth. Venus was hanging around. Now you all know Venus. She was the goddess of love. She was absolutely gorgeous. She's the one with the no arms, you know, the statue. <laughs> she, had, she had arms in real life. Now she was absolutely stunning, amazing, but she was a diva. And she was the kind who would want six silver unicorns in her dressing room and um, gilded lark's tongues for, you know, f to nibble on when she was going, along, going on. And she spent a lot of time um, island hopping, but she didn't do boats. She got into a scallop shell and she expected all the dolphins to come along and her along. She expected Neptune and the lads to get up with their conches and play for her. But she had a son called Cupid, who was a gorgeous little kid, you know, beautiful blonde curls, brown eyes, cute as a button. But being the son of a diva, he was a little brat. And he spent most of his time with bow and arrow, causing a lot of problems, making people fall in love with most unsuitable people. Oh. <laughs> but she paid no attention to that. She spent all her time island hopping. And she went off one day, she decided to do a tour of her shrines to see how things were going. And she went to her favourite shrine, which was on an island. And uh, it was her favourite because every <coughs> single person on that island used to go along. They'd be slitting the throats of bulls and throwing hyssop on fires and all that sort of stuff. And when she landed to the temple, it was empty. And the, there were no sacrifices, there was nothing happening. And she went, what the hell's going on here? What's happening? Nobody could tell her anything. So she did a quick tour around all her temples and discovered that nobody anywhere was paying any attention to her at all. And that doesn't do for a diva. But she found out that it was all to do with the king's daughters. There was a king on the mainland. And inevitably, he had three daughters. So she decided to go along and have a look at the daughters. And the first one, she had a look at the first one. The first one was very good looking by human standards. And she was married to a middle-aged guy who was extremely wealthy. So that was okay. The second one was also gorgeous. And she was also married to another middle-aged wealthy man. But the third one was spectacular. And Venus did not like this at all. And the third one, she found out the third one's name, and it was Psyche. I said, I know what I'm going to call her, Psycho. Because she was beautiful, but she wasn't that witty, really, really. So she went along to her son and said, look, do you see that Psycho one? What I want you to do is to make her fall in love with something truly hideous. Make her fall in love with... Oh, I, I don't know, a manticore or, or, or a griffin or, or a dragon or something like that. So, uh, what's his name? Cupid. Uh, Cupid went along to have a look at Psyche. Now, what Venus hadn't realised was that she was so busy throwing shapes and being absolutely beautiful and fabulous, she thought of her son as a little child all the time. She had forgotten that he'd actually grown up and his little gonads were getting at him. <laughs> and he was beginning to eye the ladies. Each time he went down to the bow and arrow, he was having a look around to see what he could see for himself. And he saw Psyche and he thought, that's the one for me. Now, Psyche was absolutely gorgeous, but she was also the original helpless female. And she was quite upset because what had happened was that all the people who used to venerate Venus were coming along and they were paying veneration to her and they were building temples and they were slitting bulls' throats and they were flinging hiss upon fires. And um, she was kind of concerned because it meant none of them were actually fancying her. And she went to her dad and go, Daddy, please, what am I going to do? None of them fancy me because they all think I'm way out of their league. And Cupid thought to himself, but not out of my league. And he fell madly in love with her. And uh, he decided, you have to sort something out of this. So um, the father, of course, was absolutely devoted to his youngest daughter, and he was very concerned that she wasn't getting married as well. 
But the thing that concerned him most was the idolatry that was going on. So he decided to go along and have a word with Apollo. He said, Apollo is one of the head lars in the whole God family, so I'll have a word with him. So he went along and he said, Apollo, what am I going to do? She's getting on a bit now. She's getting very long in the tooth. She's nearly 15. And she's not married. <laughs> so, you know, we better do something about this. So Apollo went, Your Majesty. Because you know gods, they always like to talk to you in big, boomy voices. <laughs> She will marry, but she will marry the winged pest. And the king went, oh my God, what is she going to marry? Is she going to end up married to a rock or, 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 or a dragon or a griffin or some hideous thing? But his wife was much more sort of down to earth. She said, look, she'll be off her hands. Don't worry about it. And it could be an angel. I mean, it could be an angel. It could be one of those magic dragons. You'd never know. <laughs> So they brought her up to the top of a mountain in her wedding dress. She's a bit of a climb in the wedding dress. And the west wind wafted her off and she landed down outside this amazing palace. Now, it was a bit Abramovich looking, you know, very blue. <laughs> the walls were made of gold and the paths were made of silver and the floors were made, actually, it was mosaic, but it was precious stones mosaic, which is like... A bit vulgar, but clearly whoever owned it had the few bob. So she went in and uh, there was nobody around. And then a voice said, oh, your majesty, you must be hungry. Come along and have something to eat. But there was no person. She just could hear the voice. So anyway, she went into the dining room, sat around, and this amazing feast appeared in front of her. There was moussaka, there was stuffed fine leaves. There was lamb kebab. See, she was Greek. She loved all this stuff, you know. And there were major flagons of retzina, which, as you know, is called the divine paraffin. Uh, for those of you who have drunk it, you'll know why. But anyway, she was Greek. She loved it. And that was grand. And afterwards, there was an invisible orchestra play played for her. And they even had an invisible television set there for her. Now, you may laugh at the idea of an invisible television set, but they are actually made by a company called Oxymorons or Us. And um, then eventually the night came. Yes, a few people got that one good. Uh, <laughs> and she went to bed and she put out the light and was about to sort of fall asleep when someone got into the bed with her. Oh my God, this was the moment she was dreading because she was going to, about to lose her cherry to a monster as far as she knew. So she put out a tentative hand expecting to feel scales or, or feathers or fur or claws. And in fact, it just felt like the most beautiful skin. So she ran her hand along the length of the body. Ooh. Ooh. This is all right. And this guy knew how to give a girl pleasure. <laughs> he knew all about erogenous zones. <laughs> now just on the side to you gentlemen here, the thing about erogenous zones is that they're like the stripes on a zebra or the pattern on a, on a, on a giraffe. They're different in everybody. Please remember this. <laughs> Take time to find out. All right. Thank you. So next morning, um, the, the, guy, the person disappeared before daybreak, but it was a very satisfied psyche that sat down to her morning bowl of cornflakes. <laughs> and things went on like this all the time. Um, he'd appear after dark, disappear before dawn, and that was all very well and fine, but it was kind of getting a bit lonely, and then she discovered she was pregnant. So one night she said to him in the bed, look, can I have the sisters along because, you know, I don't know anything about having babies, whereas they could help me out. So he said, well, yeah, but they're, I'd be nervous of them now. They want to be asking all sorts of questions. And if you tell them anything at all about me, the whole thing will just go to ruin. So she said, I won't say a word, not a word. So the sisters came along and the sisters took a look at the Abramovich type mansion and went, wow. We thought we were married to rich guys. But look at this. I mean, who could live in a house like this? It has to be a god. And then they noticed that she was pregnant. And thinking, oh my god, she's going to have a divine son. 
that's not fair. I mean, why couldn't we get a divine son? I mean, that isn't a bit fair. So they went to her anyway and they said, um, you know, like in bed, in the bedroom, what's, what's it like sleeping with a monster? And so I said, but it's not a monster. And they said, well, what is he like? And she said, well, I don't, I don't really know. You see, it's dark. <laughs> they said, well, now. You don't know what you're sleeping with. You've no idea what's going to come out of you in nine months' time. And for all you know, it'll be a lizard with three heads and claws and, and, and teeth that'll bite the tits off you. <laughs> so you better find out and be prepared. So that night, Psyche put a little oil lamp and a big lighter. Look, we've had, we've had um, unicorns. You can have big lighters. Uh, behind the arras... And she went to bed, and as soon as uh, her husband was asleep, she lit the lamp, and there was the most stunning-looking young man she had ever seen, with the most doughty, fluffy little wings on his shoulders. And she was absolutely stunned at this. Oh, my God, this is who I've been sleeping with all this time. Wow, lucky me. <laughs> and she couldn't keep her hands off him. But unfortunately, some oil spilled out of the lamp, and burnt his shoulder, and he woke up with a scream and ran straight home to his mammy. <laughs> and there, the, the castle disappeared, and there was poor Psyche left all alone and pregnant. And she wandered the world looking for Cupid, couldn't find him anywhere. Meanwhile, Venus was very pissed. Who is this little whore who hurt my son? I'm going to lay my hand and I'm going to give her what for. So she got a hold of her, she sent somebody for her and brought her up. And um, Psyche um, went down on her knees and begged to be at least allowed to see Cupid one more time before she was sent off into exile or whatever. So Venus said, um, Okay, right. And she dragged her out into the barn and she knocked over a bottle of poppy seeds and a bottle of uh, oat seeds and a bottle of wheat seeds and a bottle of sunflower seeds and said, right, sort those out by morning and maybe, maybe I'll let you have a look at them before I, I decide what to do with you. So poor old Psyche didn't know what to do. So she did her helpless female thing. She cried and she looked helpless. And I don't know what it is about helpless women, but men love them. And do you know what? They come along to you, they, they love them, they marry them, and five years later they come along to you and go, I should have married you. And you say, well, duh, I told you you should. Am I getting a little autobiographical? <laughs> so anyway, a male aunt appeared and went, ah, didn't. And she's so pretty. And he called on his pals. And they sorted out the seeds, and Venus was going, oh, I don't know about this, you've got a lot of help. I'll have to give you something else to do. See those sheep out there? They're gold sheep. I went to skein of the wool. So, Psyche went off out to have a look at the sheep, and the sheep were rabid, vicious creatures. So she didn't know what was she going to do, so she stood, and she cried, and looked helpless. And a, a reed standing by went, ah, did it. And she's so pretty. And he said to her, Capricia, I tell you, what you do is you wait until the sheep have gone to get some water. And then you can get their, their wool off the bushes. So that's what she did. She brought the wool back. Venus was very pissed off with this. She didn't think this is right at all. So she said, OK, you have to get another thing for me. And she sent her off to get water from the river Styx. At a place where it came in a cataract out of a mountain. But what she hadn't told her was that it was guarded by dragons and they were very nasty. So poor old Psyche was there again doing her helpless female thing. She cried and she looked helpless and the local eagle went, ah, did it. And she's so pretty. And he did it for her. And she came back. And at this stage, Venus thought, no, no, you're a witch. That's what it is. I can't have you anywhere around me. You have to go down to the underworld and you have to get me... Um, some of the Queen of the Underworld's special ointment for beauty. So at this stage, Psyche said, it's all over. The only way of getting to the Underworld is to die. So she went up to the top of a tower and was all ready to jump off the tower and commit suicide. But before she did that, she cried and looked helpless. 
And the tower went, oh, Dizzy's. <laughs> She's so pretty. And gave her the whole rigmarole of how you get into the underworld. Now, we know all about it. Money for the ferry man, food for the dog, don't talk to anyone, and whatever you do, don't open the box. <laughs> So off she went, she went down into the underworld, she did all the things, she got the box, she came back, and when she was back out from the underworld, she said, I just have a little look. <laughs> so she had a little look, and of course there was no cream in it at all. In fact, what was in it was a Stygian drowsiness that came over her and she fell asleep. And at this point, Cupid recovered from his illness, from his burnt shoulder. And he decided, he decided he'd come along and have a look and see if he could find Psyche. So he found her, of course, being a god, he had no problem finding things. And he took away the uh, Stygian gloom, or the Stygian sleep, and he said, enough is enough. My mother's been getting in the hair too much. Let's do something about it. And he brought Psyche up to Jove. And he said, look here, you're the chief head lar. Will you sort my mother out? And Jove took a look at Psyche and said, I wouldn't mind giving her one. <laughs> and Cube said, no, no. And Joe said, okay, fair dues, fair exchange, no robbery. I'll sort out your mother if you sort me out a flock of gorgeous young women with your arrow. So Cube said, fair, okay, fine. <laughs> so Joe went along to Venus and said, what's the problem? What's your problem anyway with Psyche? And she said, well, she's human. That's the problem. So Joe said, fine, I'll give her some nectar, gave her some nectar, she turned into a goddess, they had a huge wedding, this was a shotgun wedding of course at this stage, <laughs> uh, but they did the whole temple thing, they had priests, they had feasts, they had bulls getting their throats slit, the usual thing, and they lived very happily, and then eventually, nine, well it wouldn't have been nine months at this stage, but some time later, the daughter was born, and the daughter was known as Pleasure. 